You're listening to Bible Prophecy Daily, a weekday podcast where Bible prophecy matters and matters greatly. Greetings, fellow believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. In a previous episode, I discussed the expectation of Christians concerning the second coming of Jesus. Now, I want to look at the expectation of Christians who must live here in this present evil age. I guess this could be seen as part two of the expectation of the church, talking about the same things, but from a different perspective. Jesus used two images to communicate what things must happen before his return. He used the image of beginning birth pains, and he used the image of the signs of summer. Concerning the church, Jesus taught what believers can expect to experience during their lifetime here on earth. That is, the sufferings of this present time, which, of course, as Paul wrote, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us at the revelation of our Lord Jesus. As Paul traveled from city to city, he taught, it is necessary that through many afflictions we shall enter the kingdom of God. And then, concerning the word in the, the world in general, Jesus pointed out the normal social and environmental events that must occur in the days and years prior to his second coming. It was just a few days before Christ was crucified. The disciples were admiring the beauty of the temple. Teacher, check out these wonderful stones and wonderful buildings. And Jesus, without batting an eye, answered them, Do you see these great buildings? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. Yeah, he told them that the whole thing was going to be destroyed. Now later, as one of four questions, the disciples asked him, when will that happen? The answer Jesus gave is recorded at Luke 21, 12 through 24. The four questions the disciples ask are, When will these things be? What will be the sign of these things? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? Mark seems to limit the questioning to Peter, James, John, and Andrew at Mark 13.3, but surely they are simply the ones speaking in turn as all the disciples would be present. Perhaps, Once the first disciple spoke, the next one asked what was on his mind. The result would seem like Jesus is suddenly bombarded with the curiosity of the disciples as they spoke in turn without waiting for an answer to even the first question. I can imagine, just to speculate for fun, Peter could start, when will these things happen? James says, yes, and what will be the sign of these things? And then John says, and for that matter... What will be the sign of your coming? And finally, Andrew adds, yes, and the sign of the end of the age. The answers of Jesus recorded for us in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13 and Luke 21 is known as the Olivet Discourse. In this teaching, Jesus gave us an outline for the history of the church from its inception in 30 AD to the start of the time period known as the end of the age. That end of the age time period will begin with the arrival of Jesus in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and it will be completed at the end of the Messiah's thousand-year earthly kingdom. That time period is also designated as the day of the Lord. Technically, it's a transition period between this age, which is the age of human history, and the age to come, which is the eternal age. These two different time periods 
are seen actually at several places. At Mark 10.30, the present age or time period is characterized by various normal life activities and is contrasted with the age to come, which is characterized by everlasting life, to be experienced through a new resurrection body. Uh, Mark, or Jesus, teaches uh, that the faithful believer who sacrifices various details of life will receive a hundred times as much now in this time period, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, everlasting life. At Ephesians 1.21, Paul wrote, This is according to the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Now, the three gospel accounts of the Olivet Discourse are very tricky to correlate and harmonize. But those details are not within the scope of this episode. So basically, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus told the disciples what to expect during three specific time periods. The first period from that time until the actual fall of Jerusalem, which, of course, is not going to happen until 40 years later. The second time period would be from the fall of Jerusalem until the start of the tribulation. Uh, that is the general historical trends that will characterize human history until the rise of the Antichrist. And the third period from the start of the tribulation until his second coming, which is the event that begins the end of the age and the day of the Lord. Jesus started by... Uh, teaching about the general historical trends that he called the beginning of birth pains. They are the beginning of birth pains because they are the intermittent pushes and shoves that lead up to the final birth of the child. In this image, the birth of the child is the end of the age, that is, the second coming of Jesus. And the intermittent pushes and shoves are the general and normal historical trends leading up to the end. However, in regard to these beginning birth pains, Jesus said, don't be disturbed about it, for that is not yet the end. It is not yet time for the birth of the child. Before the birth, before the end, there must come the final birth pains, which, of course, are much more intense and occur in a shorter period of time. Jesus prefaced his teaching about the birth pains with the warning not to be deceived by false teachers and false messiahs, nor by the nature and severity of those historical trends. There are basically three categories to those trends. Recorded for us at Luke 21, 8 through 11. At verse 8, he said, See to it that you are not misled, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Don't go after them. So there will be false teachers and messiahs attempting to distract the world away from the truth of the gospel. The second category is military in nature, verses 9 and 10. And when you hear wars and revolts, don't be alarmed, for these things must take place first, but that is not yet the end. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In other words, wars are going to intensify from local confrontations to wider international confrontations. The third category is more natural in scope. Verse 11, and in various places there will be massive earthquakes, plagues, and famines. But all these things are just the beginning of birth pains. He clearly makes a point that these are the beginning of birth pains and not the final ones. History can be called as a witness that these things have been going on for over 2,000 years, and, and even before that, for that matter. And the same things are currently being experienced at various places all over the world. But the words of Jesus still apply. See to it 
that you are not disturbed, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Now, there is another specific period of time that will take place before the beginning birth pains. Jesus tell them, tells them what to expect during the years leading up to the fall of Jerusalem. At Luke 21, 12, after stating that there will be beginning birth pains, Jesus said, but before all these things, that is, before the beginning birth pains, the beginning birth pains is the period of time that will begin after the fall of Jerusalem. So in Luke 21, 12 through 24, Jesus explains what the disciples can expect during the time leading up to the destruction of the temple and the city. He does this without giving any kind of time for that destruction to occur. So reading at Luke 21, Starting at verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. So at verse 12, we have the persecution that will come from both Jews and Gentiles. The mention of synagogues indicates that this is a period of time before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. For after the destruction of the nation of Israel, the Jews are scattered all throughout the Roman Empire and their influence is simply relegated to nothing. Synagogues will be shut down. There will not be any persecution activity from the Jews. At verse 13, it says it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony, indicating that the, uh, the Christians, the disciples specifically, since it's uh, during the period of time, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, they will have an opportunity for, to communicate the gospel. Uh, at verse 14, he says, make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourself. Don't make a plan. Don't rehearse a speech. Just uh, know the truth that you've been taught and depend upon the Holy Spirit. For Jesus will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. That is, they will not be able to logically, reasonably, accurately, historically contradict anything that you proclaim with regard to the gospel, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. But, uh, of course, in view of your representation of the gospel, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. That is, you will be secure in the plan of God. Whether you die or not, you will be secure in the plan. And death is according to the wisdom and timing of God. And nothing to be feared for the Christian. By your endurance, you will uh, preserve your souls. At verse 20, the time frame, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of the city depart, and let not those who are in the country enter the city, because these are the days of vengeance in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. That is, all things concerning discipline on the nation of Israel because of the rejection of the Messiah. <coughs> Verse 23. Woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days, for there will be a great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. Again, wrath from God, disciplinary in nature, because of the rejection of the Messiah. Verse 24, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, will be led captive into all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That is, until the second coming of Jesus, the city of Jerusalem, the whole land of Palestine for that matter, will be under Gentile domination. 
Now, at verse 25 of Luke's account, Luke jumps from the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and skips through the many years of the beginning birth pains, and he even skips over the rise of the Antichrist and jumps right to the cosmic signs that will announce Christ's second coming. He records, There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting from fear and the expectation of the things that are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But it is Matthew and Mark who record the end of the beginning birth pains and the advance into the final and more intense birth pains of the Great Tribulation. Matthew 24, 9 and following. It is the rise of the Antichrist and the abomination event that will initiate the final birth pains that will lead to the end of the age and the second coming of Jesus. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 9 begins with the word then. The word is tota in the Greek. This is a very clear chronological advance from the beginning birth pains to something different. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Now, I really need to point out the correct translation here. The King James reads, then they will deliver you up to be afflicted. But in the Greek, the construction the word for affliction is a noun. It's not a verb. It's the noun flipsis, which means affliction or tribulation. And it should be translated, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. So this indicates that the disciples will come under a specific onslaught of persecution. However, we need to recognize that the disciples are addressed basically as representatives of the church as a whole. Jesus is saying that there will be a, a future generation of the church that will come under a unique and severe period of persecution that is called the tribulation. The tribulation will begin with the abomination event prophesied by Daniel. And in Matthew 24, 9 through 14, Jesus describes the nature of the tribulation and the persecution that will come from those who hate him. So once again at Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. Uh, again, we need to recognize that th these are Christians being persecuted. Only Christians are going to be hated on account of my name, Christ's name. And at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. This indicates that there's going to be a very serious apostasy, a falling away, a turning away from truth, moral and spiritual truth. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. But verse 12, and because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. So you have two aspects of apostasy or falling away here. You have a spiritual falling away. And you have a moral falling away, which uh, is referenced by the phrase, most people's love will grow cold. At verse 13, but the one who endures to the end shall be delivered. Uh, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. And then the end shall come. There is then a specific generation of the church that will experience the great tribulation. Now, although Christians would experience many degrees of persecution from the time after the resurrection of Jesus, here he mentions the specific persecution that will come in connection with the rise of the Antichrist. Of course, he does not mention that directly, but refers to it by mentioning the prophecy of Daniel. In Matthew 24, 15, Jesus said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then you will know that this is what will trigger the tribulation. 
The use of the word therefore indicates how the believers will know when this specific time of tribulation will begin. It will be after the abomination event spoken by Daniel. After that abomination event, which of course is the rise of the Antichrist and his physical and spiritual conquering of Jerusalem, believers in Jesus the Messiah will come under the persecution of the tribulation. So Jesus told us to go back to the book of Daniel. At Daniel 7.25, speaking of the Antichrist, it says he will speak against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One, that is the Messiah. And at Daniel 12.1, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Jesus and Daniel described it in general. But it is given to John to reveal to us the specific nature of this great tribulation. By the way, I need to point out that there is not a tribulation and a great tribulation. It is one tribulation period. It is simply the tribulation, that is, it is a great one. So John in uh, Revelation 13, um, there we learn that it was given to the Antichrist to make war with the saints. And his helper, the false prophet, will kill any who will not take the mark of the beast and worship the image of the beast. And furthermore, no one will be able to engage in normal economic activity unless they take the mark of the beast. So this means that Christians will truly have to live in uh, an underground type environment, barely surviving for lack of basic food and other essentials. Families need to be protected if possible, but single Christians have the choice and let me suggest the duty to stand up for Christ and proclaim the gospel at every opportunity. Survival skills and equipment should be a part of every family's resources, not just in view of the future tribulation, should it come in our lifetime, but also in case of any disaster scenario, such as wars, earthquakes, plagues, tornadoes, etc., any of those beginning birth pain troubles. But of course, the big difference between the tribulation and these various disasters is that in these various disasters, there won't be people running around trying to take your head. However, they, they, they might be trying to take your resources. How the believer deals with all those issues, that's a whole nother issue. But as the believer learns and applies the truths of God's word, he will, of course, be spiritually stable and be able to endure whatever he encounters. Now, the second image that Jesus used to teach about his second, com second coming was the signs of summer. That is the leaves on the trees. At Luke 21, he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see for yourselves and know that summer is now near. So you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that the Son of Man is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation, that is the generation that sees these things, will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, now what are all these things that he's referring to? They must be seen to refer to the events that have a specific starting point. Can't refer to the beginning birth pains because they are, are general historical trends that will occur for many years. And in fact, to date, have gone on for 2,000 years. It must refer to something specific. The specific event mentioned in Matthew 24, 15. That is the abomination event and the tribulation that follows it. And according to Matthew 24, 29 through 31, it is then after the tribulation has been brought to an end. That is, it's cut short by the decree of God the Father that the cosmic signs will announce the arrival of the day of the Lord. And then Jesus will return in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, as he said, at an unknown day and hour. And it is at that time that the rapture will occur. 
That is, the angels will gather together Christ's elect out from the farthest end of the earth unto the farthest end of the sky for a meeting with the Lord in the sky. Very important uh, factor with regard to the gathering of the elect there is that Jesus said that the angels will gather his elect. That is Christ's elect. That is very important indication that it refers to Christians who are gathered together at this time. Well, therefore, as we are exhorted throughout all the pages of the New Testament, summarized by Peter, we should strive to maintain moral and spiritual conduct, looking for and promoting the day of God. And as stated by John, we should maintain our fellowship with Jesus so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his appearance. Again, we should be exhorted to learn and use, focus on the character of God, the promises that he's given us with regard to living a stable, functional life as Christian ambassadors representing Jesus Christ to the gospel, uh, to the world through the gospel. <clears throat> to this end, I exhort all of us to uh, spend time in the word and in prayer and in worship. Hope you all have a great day. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless all of you. Thanks for listening to Bible Prophecy Daily. We hope you learned something valuable today. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode.